Good morning. Welcome to City Lights. Please stand. Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day where we get to celebrate your coming into Jerusalem, Lord. And I'm just reminded now of how joyful and excited the people of Jerusalem were as you came in. Um, but also reminded, Lord, just of your sadness and how um, you saw our brokenness even then. But we thank you, Lord, because we know that Easter is coming. We know that your purpose for coming into Jerusalem, Lord, was that you would die for us, but also you would resurrect and you would bring us into new life. And so we just look ahead today. We look ahead in anticipation, but also looking back in gratitude for what you've done, Jesus. So thank you that you've come, Lord. Thank you that you've come to save us. We need you. We never lose our need for you. And so I pray as we worship this morning, we would recognize our need. Um, but also express our thankfulness, Lord, for all that you've done for us in saving us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.
salvation, Lord. Only give you all the glory. Salvation is found in you. Let's take a moment, just reflect on Jesus' is coming. What Palm Sunday is about is us recognizing our need for him. It's easy to celebrate Easter because we know what happens, you know, we know the end of the story, but, but to remember where we were without him, to remember our helplessness, it helps us to appreciate who he is and what he brings. Amen. So I just want to take a moment now and just, just thank the Lord that he's come for us. Thank him that he's made a way for us. In the midst of our need, we just say thank you, Lord. We thank you for the journey that you brought us on. We thank you that, Jesus, as you looked on Jerusalem and you wept for Jerusalem, Lord, you looked on us and you wept for us. And so we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you've come and that you've given us purpose and direction in your kingdom, a place in your kingdom. Just reflect on that just for a moment. This isn't just another church holiday, you know. It's so important to know where we've been. And even now that we're still those people who need him so much, we haven't lost our need. So help us, Holy Spirit, to recognize our need. Help us, Lord, to align ourselves with you. time, the end of that song, just that the Lord would break our hearts, that he would change us, that his spirit would come and make a difference in us, that we wouldn't just be here out of habit, but giving him permission to come and, and change things around us, to transform us from the inside out. Oh 
his heart upon the cross and from his wounds his mercy why we sing. And we thank you just for fulfilling us today, fulfilling our need for a Savior, that we stand here today saved, bought and paid for, alive, clean, righteous, whole, because of you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and I pray that your spirit will continue to remind us of that as we continue today. In your name, everyone said, amen. Y'all can have a seat. All right, if you're a kid, don't leave just yet. Come sit right down here in the front. Not on this stage that Mr. Timothy and Mr. Scott built, but um, sit right down here in front. Do not beat your neighbor with their palm fronds. That's the rule, all right? You can't, you can't beat your neighbor. Here, y'all fill in right around here. And I'm going to have Hayden and Evelyn and Rowan come up. They're going to help me do the resurrection eggs. Y'all give them a second. All right, y'all sit down. Yep, yep, sit down. All right. All right. Everybody good? Okay. So, good morning. I'm Kristen. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, if you don't know what these are, and you missed it last week, these, they're called Easter eggs. That's right. They're called resurrection eggs. And so these are Easter eggs that tell the story of the gospel. Um, so if you have friends or family, these are pretty cool. Um, there also should be plenty of open seats now. We tried to squeeze as much as possible, but... If you have an open seat next to you and you see somebody looking around back there, you know, flag them down. All right, so 
We are going to um, get Hayden and Evelyn and Rowan to help us. We're actually going to have Hayden do a real quick one at the beginning. We're going to open it up, and he's going to tell us what it is. All right, what you got? You want to show everybody? What is it's it? a whip. A whip. All right. That's a dang. <laughs> dang. <laughs> Started off with a bang on Palm Sunday. <laughs> You thought that was just for Good Friday, all right? <laughs> uh, the pilot took Jesus and flogged him. All right. All right, Evelyn, you ready? You want to open the next one? What you got? Show everybody what it is. What is that, guys? A rooster. A rooster, right? Anybody know what that rooster is? Don't tell. She's going to read. All right, you ready? You do. But Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Sorry, it, was, it is kind of a downer this morning. I, I do feel a little bad about that, but it is the Easter story, so stay, come next week, and it'll be great. All right, ready, Hayden? What you got? A crown of thorns. A crown of thorns. All right. You got it? Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of Jews, Matthew 27, 27 through uh, 29. All right, thank you. All right, Rowan, what's our last one for today? Let's see what's in here. What you got? A cross. Of what? What is it made of? Um, nails. 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 All right. You want to read for us? Yeah. Go for it. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the school, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, on one on either side. And Jesus between them. John 19, verse 16 through 18. All right. And I just would like to reiterate what Ashley said. A little homeschool lesson there. Aramaic and Golgotha, those are hard words, right? Woo! All right. So, guys, y'all give a big round of applause to my friends up here. And, kids, if you will go find Miss Julie in the back. She's right back there. If you missed getting a palm frond, Mr. Sam has those. And he can hook you up. Thank you guys so much. Y'all give them a round of applause as they head out. That's hard to get up here in front of all you guys. I know, girl. <laughs> all right. Um, so back to our regularly scheduled announcements. Um, this, is a, this is a fun season, although that was a bit of, a, of an intense, um, intense Easter eggs. Uh, next week they're a little more fun. Um, <coughs> so we are coming up on Easter. Um, it's Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. We will have some donuts outside after the service, so make sure you grab some donuts on the way out. We did not give those ahead of time because I was there was no way I was sending a bunch of sugared up children downstairs um, when it's not my serve Sunday, you know, so we're just doing the Lord's work. Um, so <coughs> we're going to talk a little bit about Easter. Um, next Sunday, we will have three services, okay? Our normal 9 and 1030, but we are adding a 7 a.m sunrise service. If you woke up at, um, some of you are shaking your heads, and I don't appreciate it, okay? I, if Jesus died on the cross and rose, okay, before sunrise, you know, you can too. Um, and so 7 a.m., it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great time. It might be freezing. You may all be wearing sweaters that are bright colored instead of Easter dresses, um, but it's going to be a great time. So we will have Swamp Rabbit Cafe treats um, for only the 7 a.m. service. The rest of you get, you guys get Sam's, um, you know, accoutrements. Um, <coughs> so we will be in the parking lot, and um, 
so dress warm if you are coming. Um, I do think the high is supposed to be 78 and sunny, so it should be fine, right? Kyle's going to be there. I volunteered him to do coffee at the 7 a.m. service, so pray for Kyle. Um, and um, that's what happens sometimes. And um, anyway, but we will have kids at both the 9 and the 1030 next week, okay? So if you, normally we only have kids, all of kids at the 9, and we just have tiny lights at the 1030, we will have kids at both the 9 and the 1030, not the 7. The whole idea behind the 7 a.m. service is typically um, we are right at capacity um, for fire code in this building. So if you feel like the Holy Spirit is inviting you to come to the 7 a.m., we want you to do that because we want to also honor the fire code so we don't get shut down, you know? Um, so there's, there's some rhyme and reason to that. Um, there, is, there is a such thing as a fire code, and we do have to abide by the laws of the land. So um, I am going to bring Meredith up here. Meredith Ball, where'd she go? There she is. All right, so we're going to do something special. At, we're going to start it at the Sunrise Service. It'll be there the whole, I know, the stage is crazy. Um, so we, we're going to show some pictures of, we're going to do a living cross this year. Sorry about this. And Meredith grew up um, at a church that did a living cross. We have Chris Miller. Is he in here? Where'd he go? Where's he? He's outside on security. Y'all thank him. He is building the cross for us, um, which is awesome because you got to have skills all over. But this is, uh, these are some examples of living crosses. And um, people, uh, basically on Easter Sunday, they come and decorate with flowers. So next week, we're asking you guys to bring flowers, bring greenery, and help decorate our living cross. And so Meredith is going to share a little bit about her memories of that growing up and how it works. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. Um, so I grew up in a pretty traditional United Methodist Church, and every year we did the living cross. I've heard it called, you know, a ton of different things over the years, like the Easter cross, flower cross, but we always called it the living cross, um, which I loved because it brings such a good, like, symbolism to Easter. Um, basically what it is, it's a wooden cross. You cover it in chicken wire, and then you use greenery and flowers to decorate it. So by the end, once everybody has it decorated, it's going to be beautiful and alive with flowers. So it'd be great. Tell, tell me a little bit, tell everyone here about yeah. your memories of it growing up as a yes. kid. Yes. So it was my favorite thing as e at Easter every year to see the cross um, because it was always just so full of flowers. It was beautiful. We always took pictures in front of the cross. And my parents have a ton of pictures somewhere. I asked my mom to find some, but she couldn't find any of them. Um, but somewhere we have a bunch of pictures of my sister and I. So it was the thing as a kid that I looked forward to the most at Easter. Awesome. All right. So bring your flowers, yeah. bring your greenery. All right, on Easter Sunday, okay, starting at the 7 a.m. service, that's where we're going to start it, all right, bring your own flower, Br you hear that, Erica Millen is saying it so that she remembers, everybody say it with me, bring your own flowers, I did not hear you all, bring your own flowers, okay, great, so it's going to be really fun only if everybody participates, so it's a new tradition, we haven't done it before, um, so I think it'd be a really fun one to start. I know that typically that's done in more traditional uh, churches and things, but, you know, we have a lot of, you know, strip malls out here, and so it kind of serves a purpose to beautify. It's a great picture backdrop, and it's living. So, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, and last but not least, um, our upcoming events um, after Easter, we have um, our next City Life is on April 14th, which is if you have been coming here for a while and you'd like to become a member, this is um, the sign-up for that, April 14th, right after church. Um, and then on April 21st, we'll have our next equipping environment, which will be with um, Andrew Sharp, yes, who is uh, the pastor of Hope Church Greenville. Um, and he is going to be talking about personal prayer. And um, so that should be a really fun one, um, probably very interactive as well. Um, and uh, so we'd love to have you. You can sign up online. And those are our next things. If you have a prayer request or you would like to fill out a Connect card, we would love to connect with you. Um, you can put those in the little black box, or you can take them to the Next Steps table out front and to the right, um, right at the end of service. So, um, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to pray for Oliver, and we will get started. Um, <coughs> Lord, I thank, you, um, I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. I thank you for the gift of the resurrection. And... Um, Father, I just ask that as we go through this season, um, that we would seek your face, that we would seek your heart, and uh, Lord, I ask that we would not move through this week um, with flippancy, um, but with um, just with um, just a, a reverence for your um, love 
a reverence for your spirit um, and for your authority in our lives. And so, Lord, we just ask um, that this morning um, you would speak to us um, in a way uh, that is new and refreshing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I feel a little bit taller this morning than usual. Um, shout out to Timothy and Scott uh, for uh, manufacturing, homemade manufacturing this awesome stage. There is a secret reason why that all exists is because we needed more room on the stage because we're going to have a choir on Sunday morning. But I'm super excited about that. I do have to adjust my eyes, eye line right now and figure out how, where I am and my, uh, see if my uh, stage lighting is um, uh, complementary to my face and complexion or not. We'll have to see how that shows up. Things that preachers don't think about, right? And I'm probably going to take a seat. All right. How do I look? Okay. You got to <laughs> try new things. Might as well try. Uh, new things on, on Palm Sunday. Good to see you guys. Um, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to lament with you all that I did have a, a, a Palm shirt that I wanted to wear from Forever 21 this morning. And both because of the weather and because of my wife, uh, I decided against that. I <laughs> have on this 50% uh, out J. Crew uh, sweater that I got for Christmas that I was not allowed to wear uh, at Christmas time because in Greenville, Christmas is 70 degrees. Can we just move like daylight savings time from months, not just days, so that we can like have it cold when it's supposed to be cold? I'm just uh, kind of confused. Um, also, uh, if you do feel that um, your seat is a little more Delta Airlines this morning, it is because they've been turned into coach. Yeah, we've scooted the seats together, so there's a little bit less leg room. There is an airbag, uh, a little uh, doggy bag in the front. I'm just kidding. Uh, but we're, we're, we're trying to make room and, and honor the fire code, as Kristen is talking about. So thanks for all uh, you guys that are at least praying about coming to the, uh, to the sunrise service. All right, do you have your Bibles? Will you open up with me to uh, uh, Mark chapter 11? And um, uh, this is, uh, I feel like this is just comfortable territory for me uh, because before I was a, a, a preaching pastor, I was a youth pastor. And the Palm Sunday passage is what the youth pastor always preaches. You're always preaching that on Palm Sunday because the senior pastor is preferring for Easter. But I don't have a youth pastor, so I do both of them, you know? And... Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, yeah, um, it's an interesting passage because it doesn't move. You know, uh, on Easter, you can preach out any of these Gospels. You could preach on 1 Corinthians 15. You could preach on Philippians. There's lots of things on, Palm, or on Easter you could talk about. On Palm Sunday, you're just talking about this. You're talking about palms. And we're back here, guys. We're back here at the palms. And I have a disgruntled, like, all week. It's the hardest sermon, right? Because it's the time when everybody comes back to church. I got to get down from here a little bit. Just, it's so much. Um, it's, it's, it's. It's lots of people. There's lots of, you know, like people come back to church. It's new people. And you're talking about donkeys and prophecy and politics and just a bunch of crazy stuff. And you're like, Lord, why couldn't this just be simple? We want to talk about people's marriages and kids and all that kind of thing. And uh, I do think it's relevant. There is some peeling of the onion, I guess, to do about it. Um, but, um, but you can sense, right, the tension um, uh, of the passage, but also just even this morning of the kids. Like Easter is both uh, a season of great hope, expectation, but it's also a season of sorrow. Like, uh, it's, it's a season of, um, I love the great theolo theological uh, framework here that I think um, N.T. Wright was the first one I ever heard, but the already not yet of the kingdom is that people are healed, but also healing's delayed. That we're the righteousness of Christ, but also, like, we have flesh on our bodies. Like, to be a Christian is to be uncomfortable. It's to open up the Easter egg and sometimes pull out, you know, whips or, uh, or, uh, or, or Peter's, Peter's betrayal, but also um, life and life abundant in the full. And I think it's fitting. I think that it's, uh, it's spiritually apt, you know, that we would open up Easter eggs this morning and talk about some of the sweet and sour things, um, some of the things that make Christians uh, experience comfort, but also discomfort. That Easter, if we really allow Easter, the holiday, to wash over us in its original intent, is to be ready, but also completely unready. Completely expectant, but also have no expectations about what God is about to do. Uh, because um, of anything, you know, the empty tomb um, shouldn't just be put into a, a, a trite little tradition for our, for our everyday kind of April or March in this case, in this sense. Um, in sixth grade, uh, I had my first guy teacher uh, that some of us do because, you know, all the guy teachers, they can't, they don't want to be down there in first grade or whatever. So I had my first guy teacher uh, in Catholic school called Mr. Rosamelia. And uh, Mr. Rosamelia had hair growing in all the wrong places. Uh, he had no hair here, but he had hair coming out of his nose. He's a good old-fashioned Italian dude. And uh, he, had, um, he had a tie. He wore a tie every single day. And he kind of smelled a little bit like mothballs. Like you were just like, what is that smell that kind of smells like an attic? I uh, had the same jokes every year, wear the same loafers. And, uh, and uh, I got into Mr. Rosamelia's class in the sixth grade. And um, 
And uh, I really think uh, he was not necessarily a teacher that we all wanted, but he was the teacher that we needed. Uh, he, um, he would have these little peppermint candies that would sit on his desk. And uh, sometimes when you just need sugar in the middle of the day, you would just love how much, you know, how much you would turn down a, a peppermint on Halloween. But in the middle of third period, you'd be like, I can't wait for this little peppermint. So I'd have little peppermints. And he would give these like little instructions. He would teach uh, about the Bible, like about Moses and stuff like that, because he's a religion teacher, uh, about how um, uh, that the, the Exodus and the Moses story was a lot like a football game. And he'd uh, put out all these analogies about uh, moving into the promised land and so forth, the way that a quarterback would like move his people on a football field. There's some correlation there, I'm sure. And... Uh, and so, and, and, and we would, um, we would kind of uh, make our way through the year uh, with Mr. Rose Amelia, our first guy teacher, because heaven help those guy teachers. Um, it's just not quite as uh, nurturing, should I say, as uh, when you're in the uh, third grade class with Mrs. Jones or whatever. Uh, I love that Mr. Rose Amelia would call us guys knuckleheads. Uh, he'd be like, you knucklehead, like what is wrong with you? You guys need to grow up and get a job. You know, it's basically what his message was. You know, you guys are knuckleheads and you guys need to get together. And I love the fact that he was able to challenge us, um, but also uh, not tear us down at the same way, at the same time. That he was, um, he was a guy um, that could speak to guys in a challenging ways that felt like it was calling us up and not, not pushing us down. And through the year, um, you know, Mr. Rosamilia was not um, the sexy Steve teacher, you know, that was 22 years old with the cool tattoos. You know, he wasn't super fun, uh, but he was faithful. Mr. Rosamilia um, uh, was not um, uh, this, the sharpest or smartest, you know, teacher uh, that you would ever meet in college or something like that, uh, but, he, but he was very real. He did really care, and that he, he did live his life out as an example. Um, and although Mrs. Mr. Rosemilia was not super cozy um, and, uh, you know, give you the best feelings and butterflies in your stomach when you sat there, as some of your cute teachers were, right, in fourth grade, uh, if you had, had, a, had a female teacher or whatever, uh, but he was safe, and he was consistent. And, um, and it's through those years, and really in retrospect as a young man, you know, right there in a tween age from 12 to 13, you realize Mr. Rosamilia, again, was not the kind of teacher you would have selected for yourself, would have chosen for yourself. He wasn't the one that you wanted, but he was the one you needed at that phase in life. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the counselors that you want, the doctors that you want, the teachers or the pastors that you want, they're not the ones that you want, but they are the ones that you need. Because sometimes what you want is not what you need, and sometimes what you need is not what you want. And so what is it um, about Palm Sunday, you know? that could be so fickle about the crowds entering up the gates of Jerusalem, welcoming in the king on the donkey with the palm branches and the kids and, and all the fanfare and the J. Crew sweaters, or uh, in Florida, the Palm Sunday church, is um, so much happens from the Sunday that we're seeing each other to the next Sunday that we'll see each other. Like, don't skip the Bible reading plan between Palm Sunday and Easter because a lot of stuff happens that's very important. That by the time from Sunday, this Sunday, in our church liturgical calendar to the next Friday, um, we go not only from throwing cloaks upon donkeys for Jesus to ride as saddles, but swapping cloaks of the blood-soaked uh, cloaks of Jesus and throwing lots for his clothes, how much changes from Sunday to Friday, that the, the clothing that we put on, on the donkey for Jesus becomes, uh, by the end of Friday, really the, uh, the casting of lots to trade out the cloaks of Jesus. That, the, th that the, uh, the palms that were waving on the streets, you know, at the beginning of Sunday on Palm Sunday with exuberant excitement uh, doesn't always turn out the way that we think it was. The expectations we have for Sunday are let down by Friday. By the time we get to Friday, we're not giving him palms. We're giving him thorns on his forehead. And by, by Friday, whereas the crowds are, are shouting things like Hosanna, which in the Hebrew idiom means to be saving us, saving us now, uh, is changed and transformed into crucify him. What can change in just a week when expectations are... Um, are let down when they're recal recalibrated, recapitulated. And so um, ultimately, you know, what is the tension? What is the reason for the awkwardness of the youth pastor teaching on Palm, Palm Sunday, a sermon that nobody really wants to hear, and, 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 uh, and a reading of, of a kind of triumphant and sweet moment of Jesus, but paradoxically also a super sad moment at the same exact time, other than the fact that Jesus came to the Israelites the same way he comes to us, not as the Savior necessarily that we wanted, but it is the Savior that we needed. Jesus came to Israel in those streets that day, and, and, and all of those children and all the believers in that town were, were, were shouting out to him praises. They weren't wrong in his praise. They, they did understand that Jesus was king rightly, but they didn't anticipate how Jesus would become king. Nobody could have anticipated that. Nobody would have wanted that. Nobody would have selected that. It wasn't the Savior that they wanted, but it was the one that they needed. And so... Um, uh, I have three uh, little points today as we make our way through this Palm Sunday uh, passage uh, this morning. But, um, but we're remembering this morning that before Jesus empties out tombs within the 
within the narrative of the scripture and really the, the, the timetables of human history, before Jesus empties tombs, he comes into Jerusalem to tear down temples. Everybody loves the idea of a, of a therapist or a counselor until that therapist or counselor comes to confront the biggest problem that you have and the reason why you're at the counselor in the first place, which is you. Everybody likes the ideal of a counselor because we anticipate this counselor vindicating us, justifying us, telling us that we're the answer to our biggest problems, and then we come to find out we're paying him to tell us the real answer, which is we're the biggest problem in the room. Jesus comes into those towns. He does not take up swords. He, he prophesies to a fig tree and says the real problem that you have is, is not that you need more swords in your life. It's that you've been hiding behind fig trees since Genesis 2. That you're hiding behind your religious dead dead salvation expectations of your own messiahship, right? And, and, and I've come not to help you pick up swords, but to tear down fig trees because before the tomb, there's a temple that needs to get destroyed. That the biggest issues for the Israelites, just like us, is not that they didn't have somebody to worship or that they, that they were worshiping Jesus, but in, in a sense, they, they had a throne and they, they did have a king and that king was the, the money changers in the temple that was in their, the, in their temples. And everybody... Has a, has a great grandiose expectation of, of, of an ideal savior, but sometimes the saviors that we need are not the ones that we want. And so there's three different um, little movements here that will make our way through the passage. First and foremost, the kingdom doesn't come just to invite us into it. It comes to invade. <laughs> it's good news today that it moves in without our permission the same way as Jesus moves into this town. Number one, through an interruptive parade. Number two, through an immature praise. And number three, an incarnational uh, prophecy. All right, so verse one. Uh, the interruption. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of them. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it to me. Jerusalem, if you're just, uh, you know, checking in uh, again, this is my job as the youth pastor to explain to you, you know, because Jewish prophecy and history in 10 minutes, right, um, is, uh, is the city of David. It was a city of, uh, of great, um, uh, notoriety within the Jewish heritage and lineage. It was the place where the fulfilled promise of the Messiah was supposed to arrive. It was the geo point where the kingdom of God was supposed to touch earth, where heaven was supposed to, to crash in. And uh, ever since David, there was an empty throne. There was a, a king that was supposed to come to rule over not only Israel, but the nations in perpetuity forever and ever and ever. And that uh, all other kings tend to get corrupted, they sleep around, they extort money, they, uh, they lead for a while, and then they get selfish and they topple over on their kingdoms. And so who would be this king? Who is going to occupy the kingdom to reign in not a temporary kingdom, but an eternal kingdom? That is what the, the covenant of David was meant to prophesy and bring about. And so Jerusalem, that has this great place of hope and expectation, has been delayed in the delivery of that uh, prophecy. And so we're waiting on a king. Now Jesus... As he comes in to bring about the kingdom of heaven, which he's been preaching about since the beginning of this book in Mark, comes in a very peculiar way. Did you see that? Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you're going to find a donkey. Back in the uh, Old Testament, when, uh, when a king would go and take a new territory, they wouldn't just go in themselves, they'd send in spies. They would send in spies to go and spy out the land and check it out, and they would look for for giants, and they look for grapes, and they look for uh, the, the, the terrain of the promised land that Joshua or whoever else was supposed to go in and invade, but they wouldn't look for donkeys. And if you paid attention to the, 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 the tenor, I guess, or the posture of, of, of the narrative here as you look into verse 1 and verse 2, um, the kingdom that is coming, apparently, that Jesus is bringing is, is not treating Jerusalem, if you paid attention, right, as a, as a friend but as an enemy, that there is a conquering that this king is doing, and uh, instead of going into the king kingdom to, uh, to pronounce peace and to pronounce that, that he had gone out to another realm, into Rome or somewhere else, into Gentile territory to bring back, you know, new spaces for the Jewish empire, it's actually going and advancing not into enemy territory, into, into their home, home court and treating it as a conquered land, treating Jerusalem, the place that was supposed to be the kingdom, as the place of conquest. This is a, 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 a strange uh, picture and a dilemma for the prophetic picture of what Jerusalem would have been. Verse 3, if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it. That's what you should do if you ever go rob a car. Uh, hey, that Bugatti, God told me. It's, it's for me. Uh, it belongs to me. Why are you doing this? Well, the Lord needs it, and he'll send it back. I'll be right back. It'll be sent back to you shortly. Uh, a couple of prophecies there from your friendly neighborhood youth pastor, Ezekiel 43, 1 through 5. Then the man brought to me uh, to the gate facing east, Bethpage, the Mount of Olives, was east of Jerusalem. 
And I saw the glory of God in Israel coming from the east, and his voice was like a roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. And the vision I saw was like the vision I had never seen when he came to not deliver the city, but to destroy it. He came to destroy the city, not deliver it. What a, what a crazy expectation from this Savior. Destroy the city. And like the visions I had seen from the Cabal River, I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered into the temple. Jesus at the bottom of this passage will enter into the temple. Through the gate facing east, and the Spirit of the Lord filled up the temple, filled up the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I take great solace in the fact that of all these people of Bible readers, that they're steeped in the scriptures, yet so surprised when Jesus comes. They're caught off guard. Even the most amount of Bible reading can't prepare. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. Nobody can, can, can teach cognitively their spirit to be ready for the surprise of the gospel in their life. Even these Jews are still asking the question, after all this prophecy has been laid out, what the heck is going on? Why are you going to get donkeys? I don't understand. Zechariah 9.9, 9, they already told them, even though they had read the scriptures, they sought the scriptures and didn't find Jesus somehow. They were blind to the words in front of them because, because his, his ways are higher than our ways. Zechariah 9.9 9 had always told them, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Don't be, don't be weirded out when the donkey comes. Shout aloud, O daughter of Zion. Behold, the king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Even the people that are most steeped in scripture continue to be surprised by the Lord's grace when it arrives. You can read about all you want. That's different from living it. And so uh, I love the Brian Johnson quote. Brian Johnson um, uh, is a worship leader at Bethel, and he says that spontaneity is the reward of the planned. You can't just spontaneity just kind of like waltz into a music set unless you know your scales, unless you know your keys, unless you know what you're doing, because spontaneity isn't, isn't just... Um, isn't, isn't a reward, it's a gift, and it, and, and it only blesses the person that's well prepared for the song and the set list they're doing, that spontaneity can come and not uproot and ruin and create utter chaos and confusion in a person's life. This week, I hope you take great solace uh, as, uh, as, as I'm empathizing with you, was uh, this week, and probably for you as well, was a week of dire interruptions for my life. I love it because, you know, I guess uh, there's a bunch of spiritual warfare and there's a bunch of confusion that can happen on a preacher's week before Easter, but my, all my cars broke down. Uh, my daughter earlier had uh, accidentally uh, run into a, 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 reindeer, a deer, a reindeer. What was it, Santa? <laughs> Ran into a deer <laughs> on the way to Chick-fil-A, broke out the whole entire chrome uh, of, of the front of the car. Um, our, our, our minivan, uh, the trusted beacon of uh, middle-class America that is uh, never supposed to let you down, our donkey, uh, fell apart. Timing belt fell apart all in the same week. Um, uh, in the meantime, um, I love, I'm a pastor, I love people, but sometimes I don't want to talk to people, and it was just lots of strangers talking to me, just random people asking me if I wanted to buy stuff in uh, Bridge City this week. It was a great week of random, interruptive uh, behaviors that were going on. Here's a C.S. Lewis quote about interruptions. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own life or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls interruptions is precisely one's real life. The life God is sending to us day by day. Here's why it is so important. As we empathize a lot with these Israelites, nobody was looking on Amazon.com for the delivery of this Messiah on the day that Jesus came and the way that Jesus came. Nobody was ready for it, even though they searched the scriptures. Because the kingdom of heaven isn't just knocking on our door and, and, and inviting us. The kingdom of heaven invades us, interrupts us, and sometimes startles us because he's a better king than me. Here's why, um, here's what happened to me as, as, as my cars were breaking down. I found myself, as you would find yourself, uh, in waiting rooms, talking to people I usually wouldn't be talking to, calling people I usually wouldn't call. And uh, in this last week, having um, important relational conversations with people on the phone while I'm in waiting rooms, because the interruptions actually weren't interruptions. They were, they were actually uh, invitations from Jesus being involved in my everyday life because he's a better king than me. I don't know if you can re relate to me in any of this, is that... Uh, I met this uh, one lady, she was like Irish, and this Indi Indian lady um, in my cul-de-sac, and as I'm going on my little prayer walk in the morning, these guys start talking to me, and they're little introverted to me, please don't look at me, please stop talking to me, I have things that I want to do, this is, I barely have an entire zoo in my house, and I get 30 minutes to myself, and I don't want to be talking to this Indian lady about chai. But sometimes the interruptions are the best gifts. Sometimes when God um, interrupts you, he's, he's teaching us, right, that, that, um, that he is a better king than us, and that he always improves on the things that, uh, that he borrows from us, so to speak. The reason why he interrupts us and the reason why he invades our kingdoms is because we're inferior kings to him. That he's a better citizen than me. He's a better neighbor than me. He's a better husband than me. He's a better pastor than me. And the reality about a plan and as a gift is that I can't plan a gift. 
is that if I wrap a little sweater up and put it under the tree and open it up, it's no longer a gift. And if I make a complete plan of my salvation, then it stops being a gift, that God is interrupting us because he's giving us the gift of his kingdom, something that we can't earn. And so I love the very end of this verse, if, if you caught it right, is that the Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. Any amount of money that he interrupts this week for you, any amount of time that he interrupts with you, any amount of reputation that is put on the line or put in stock, we know it's in good hands because anything that the Lord bar- borrows, he gives back in better condition than we give it to him. It is a good thing that he interrupts us because he is an invading kingdom, and if we planned it, it can't be a gift. Secondly, he comes through immature praise. In verse 4, they went out and found a colt outside in the street, tied to a doorway, and they untied it. And some people standing there said, what are you doing untying this colt? They answered as Jesus told them, and the people let him go. So, so the policy of scripture is that Jesus, as he enters into Jerusalem, is always the outsider. Whenever you, um, you get into a stuck point in your business, um, the reason why you have to call um, a consultant to come in and give you consulting for your business is because the people that have been at the business the long enough are the most blind. They're no longer able to see the blind sides of the company. And so we call in on outsiders. Jesus is an outsider because he is the one that is an Israelite but has to come from somewhere else than Israel. He has to come from heaven to bring in the word that they need for salvation. Most of the time, the most dysfunctional things in our home, we get to these stuck points in our life, and we have to call the counselor because if the solution could have been found within the home without the counselor, then the solution, then the problem wouldn't have existed in the first place. And so Jesus, again, does not come from, an, from the inside. He comes from the outside, and he has to bring us things that we don't know all the time or would have chosen on our own because he's a savior we needed, not always the one that we wanted. And so they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and they sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and while others spread branches, they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Timothy brought out an old school 2008 Hillsong song this morning, and I could not have been happier. Worship was just better back then, and we have just fallen off since then. And so I just want to say, before there was Maverick City, there was Hillsong, and Hillsong got it going, you know? And so, anybody know that song? Was anybody excited about singing, bringing an old school praise song? Back there, I was ready to get Darlene Sheck up here and teach y'all about the real worship, right? Um, I can remember singing those songs. They just bring back these memories. I remember the first time we sang that song in a 2008, or actually 2012, rather, Student Life Camp. You guys know what Student Life was? Uh, I was down there in Spartanburg, and uh, you'd get all those kids out there, and they'd be drinking just Mountain Dew all night and be up all night. And you'd be singing that, that, that song, Hosanna. And I actually got uh, the lyrics there um, on the screen just to kind of reflect a little bit. Hosanna, uh, the song that came out in 2012, says this. I see the king of glory coming on the clouds with fire. He says, the whole earth shakes and the whole earth shakes. I see his love and mercy washing over all of our sin. The people sing, the people sing. I mean, I've been a youth pastor for 10 years, and ultimately being a youth pastor is being a farmer, you know, and you just sow seeds. You have no idea what's going to come up out of those seeds in 10 and 12 years. But I know that those songs were not sung in vanity, that some of the, the prayers that were uttered in the deep hearts of 13-year-olds there that are now 23 and 25 and 30 years old, that some of the deep prayers have come into kingdom fruit that will never be taken away for all of eternity. There were prayers in that room that were answered, sometimes in ways that we never thought they would have been answered, prayers that did not fall on deaf ears through the lifting up of songs of ignorant teenagers that were just singing them out because they didn't have anything better to do. And so I remember singing these songs, right? Like I remember singing this song, this lyric about the whole earth shaking, and I just had these pictures, right, of like, of teenagers just like, um, uh, just, just, ca- just tossing over their idols and being broken from chains of pornography and addiction and shame and lust and all these other things. I had these pictures um, that, that I had when I remember singing these songs that the Holy Spirit almost is like speaking to us about the possibilities of what we couldn't see yet or, or the visions of what we couldn't imagine being happening, and that's the power of music to speak to the heart. And that those prayers did not fall on deaf ears. In the second passage there, in the second uh, uh, um, uh, verse of the song, it says this, I see a generation rising up and taking their place with selfless faith, with selfless face. I see a near revival stirring as we pray and seek. I remember singing these songs in 2012 as the youth leader back then, you know, at 30. We're on our knees, we're on our knees. I remember um, just getting pictures of, of, of kids like, going off into nations and, and being missionaries and, and, and being preachers and, be, and being pastors and seeing revival take place. I was getting these pictures of, of not just a local movement, but a, but a generational kind of um, global movement, this picture of mission. And lastly, a picture of, um, of heart change, of the miracle of heart change. Heal my heart, it says. Make me clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you, like you have loved me. 
Break my heart for what break yours, everything I am for your kingdom's cause, as I walk from earth into eternity. So much has happened since 2012. If you've sung those songs in Student Life Camps before, I mean, maybe emotionally, like you can remember um, the romanticism and the great hope and the expectation. And, um, and none of that is any less real today, right? I, that's the way that I feel about it, is that those words are never less true and they were ne- never less real in my heart. But at the same time, I could say to myself in a time machine backwards from 2012 to 2024, 12 years later, that although the, 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 the words and the stirrings that were going on in my heart were true and real and authentic, that the application and the fruition of those promises look way different than I ever thought that they would. Like like I had no idea, nor could you have ever wanted, desired, or told yourself that you needed, that the shaking that we needed in the church for me in 2020 was the COVID uh, mandate that took all of us by storm and all of us by surprise. That while we were asking for God to shake our world, we, we didn't necessarily have the verbiage or the understanding of how we would shake it. But all of us know that in those times of shaking, it's so important because when the world shakes, the unshakable is revealed. And God shook us in that season. We wouldn't have asked for it, but we needed it. We needed him to deliver us into the hands of our phones so we could look into our screens and realize that screens have a really powerful ability to connect us, but they do not do, do well in creating community. To learn that the future of church is not YouTube. And that moment was important that he was answering our prayers in ways that we wouldn't have wanted or ways that we couldn't have expected. That he's a prayer answer, but he doesn't always answer the prayers in the way that we would think. That sin, the, 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 the cleansing of sin, sometimes happens through, through the, the falling of churches. That sometimes we have to realize that the, that the response of our sin, ongoing, of, of just turning the other eye and, and glancing the other way of corruption that goes on in, in our own lives, that, like it has consequences, it has real consequences in our life, and we realize what sin is when we see what sin does. When we see the division of churches under under our watch, we actually realize and repent of real sin in deep ways. And of course, yes to lust and and addiction and and porn and and anxiety, but also also gossip and also slander and also self-servedness and and also all these other things that go along with what it really means to repent of sin. To seek the Lord, really, in the middle of personal grief grief and loss. To be be selfless, to really find ourselves unimportant, to, to, to see... Not only a, a global revival, but having a heart of the Lord for global poverty that happens all across our, our, our world all the time. Like these are the answers to our prayers we would have never expected. So on and so forth. And so I, I, I take, you know, I, I take a lot of solace in, in the confidence of the gospel. Like sometimes when we sing words that we don't even know what they mean, that they can be true in eternity, even if we don't understand them. That we can prophesy things and say things sometimes and pray things like, Naively, he's like, yeah, you don't even know what that means, but I'm going to bless you in that anyways. I take confidence in that. There's an old saying that worship pastors will say sometimes, and I'm not even sure I really believe it anymore, that he says that, uh, that, that the Lord is enthroned on the praises of his people. And I think that praise is a beautiful thing, not because it causes God to show up, but it causes me to show up, I think is really what's going on. And ultimately, I take a lot of confidence is that I'm glad that his, his occupancy is not dependent on my praise. That he's enthroned on the cross, on earth, and if he's not enthroned on the cross, he's certainly enthroned at the right hand of the Father today, that whether I feel like it or not, whether I need it or not, whether I understand it or not, it is always a good time to praise when we feel like it, when we don't, because if we praise in the name of Jesus, we're agreeing with the truth, no matter uh, what it is that we think or do in the first place, that Jesus is thrown, not necessarily on the praises of his people, but on the cross, and the death and the resurrection of his son. I, I take a lot of peace and solace, you know, in seeing the last 12 years of this praise song, and how it's matured, and in my life, because ultimately what he's saying when he doesn't deny these people in the streets crying out, Hosanna, save, save us, the same mouths that are going to say crucify him by Friday, is because he understands they're just children. That you and me, even today, like, there's grace and mercy for us in this place. Like, I don't expect, I'm not mad at a two-year-old for not knowing how to do judo. I'm proud of him for walking. And just like you, we're children. I think sometimes there's things that come into our minds, like maybe Maybe I shouldn't be singing that. Maybe I shouldn't be preaching that. Maybe I should wait until I'm perfect in order to preach. And I think that this is a a testimony when he says, I'm not going to deny these kids from praising because this is a process. And that that you're expected to praise with what you have in 2012 and you don't need to worry about what's happening in 2024 because you're not in 2024 yet. And that praising, like the truth and praying the scriptures is always, always a good thing. And lastly, that that understanding that even though we do have clarity and revelation, even as we sing and understand what God is saying to us now, we don't understand what God is going to say to us tomorrow. There's a daily bread tomorrow 
that just as I'm comfortable, I need to be uncomfortable, that God is going to confront me in my sin because he's an outsider and he's going to come in to tell me the words sometimes that I, that I need to hear. And so lastly, as we kind of prepare our hearts for Easter this week, we're going to see a couple of verses, but very important as we kind of understand what's about to happen in the next chapters as we get into chapter 16 next Sunday. But Jesus comes, again, not to rebuild this temple, to renovate it. He comes to resurrect it. He's coming to tear it down and do a complete inversion, a kingdom inversion of what's been prophesied about Jerusalem. Verse 11, Jesus enters, the, enters Jerusalem and goes into the temple courts. This reminds me of um, back in the old days, in the 90s, they would have these sitcoms. In the last episode, they would, like, have the main character in the Cheers bar by himself just kind of sweeping. Remember that? It was so sad. Like, remember all the memories, guys, and friends at the local perk when they were all hanging out? And there's, like, one last roll call, and they turn off the lights, and everybody screams and cries. You know, the last scene of the sitcom it reminds you of when you move out of your apartment, and you just uh, had been living there for six years or whatever, and you had your first baby, and that was where the crib was, and this is where we had our dining room table and you kind of reminisce and remember of the old times right and then you shut off the lights and there's a time that things begin and there's a time that things end and this is kind of like a a goodbye in that way in verse 11 for jesus in this temple this temple was a place of great expectation this temple was the place where aaron and the ark of the covenant was visited this is the place where david danced undignified in front of the lord this is the place where the ark of the covenant came in to bring in and bring a promise of the of the new coming kingdom this temple was supposed to be the location but the temple ultimately failed it was a law that was never reached. It was a lamb that couldn't forgive sins forever. Just animal lambs. It was a place where, where even the priests were confused, and we weren't sure the line of priesthood anymore because there was so much corruption in the priesthood. It was a beautiful dream that ultimately fell apart because it rested on the hands of human shul- shoulders and built by human hands and not by the kingdom of heaven because it needed to be built by a different temple. And so he looks around at everything just this last time as he sweeps up, And it says, because it's very late, he basically says goodbye. And look where he goes. He goes out to a different mountain, the mountain of Bethany, not the mountain of Jerusalem, to be in the 12. Jesus was saying goodbye in that very moment because he actually was becoming the law. He was prophesying in these these very moments that the law that was created for the Israelites to dwell well with God and to be a light among the nations. It wasn't the law's fault. It was the Israelites' inability in their flesh and sin to uphold and fulfill the law. And so the law, the law stood, but they fell down, and Jesus was becoming the law. He's saying, that law is going to be fulfilled in me. I have a better law. To the Levites, we aren't even sure where the pure Levite line is. The high priests are all corrupted by money and and, and corruption and politics, but he was going to be the high priest. He's going to be the one that sits at the right hand of the Father and prays for us. He's going to be the sacrificial Passover lamb. The lamb that they were going to taste in, the, in that final Passover and that final meal was going to be the last time they ever, they ever ate of an animal lamb. From then on, we were going to appeal to the son, the real lamb. So the law, the Levites, and the lamb were all going to become him, and he was going to not rebuild and renovate the temple. He was going to tear it down, as he says. Jesus tore down the temple so that in verse 11, he could live in us, to live in the 12. And so this is why Palm Sunday is awkward and why it's sour and sweet at the same time and why it makes us comfortably uncomfortable and why it represents the already not yet is because that's what Christians are. Jesus in Palm Sunday comes to us and he's not coming to us to renovate or rebuild or give us another shot or or try it at a different angle or use different materials to build up the temple. He comes in to tear down the temples that there has to be a Palm Sunday and a Good Friday before there's an Easter because before the tomb, there has to be a tearing down of our temples, of the fig leaves and the idols and, and, and the poor and, and the abusive rulership that doesn't just come from Rome, that comes from us. And so the way I, I sum it up in terms of the tension of Palm Sunday is that Jesus doesn't come to rebuild temples. He comes to resurrect. He comes to resurrect our lives. So the question I want to ask us uh, as we um, move into Easter, um, and hopefully not on autopilot, that we really are ready to be unready that we really are comfortable to be uncomfortable, that he is doing miracles in our midst, not just maintaining traditions, is this question is like, do you want to be fixed or do you want to be new? The message of Easter can get so conflated and and so fogged out by all the Easter eggs and all the pageantry and so forth. The message of Easter is not come back and try again. The message of Easter is not, maybe I'll go to Easter, maybe I'll go to the church the Sunday after Easter. The message of Easter is not, um, maybe I can, I can look at this from another, another vantage point. Jesus, can you help me fix this thing? The message of Easter is I'm dead and now I'm alive in Christ. Or I'm invited 
to recognize my spiritual deadness so that I might be made spiritually alive, the message of Easter is not to be fixed, like one of those renovation shows um, uh, on, on, on HGTV. It's to be made new, a brand new temple in Jesus, um, in Jesus' name. And so, if Jesus does come to be the Savior, maybe not the one that we wanted, but the one that he need, need then probably a lot like the readings that we'll do this week in our own personal readings of, of Holy Week, he comes to point out our fig leaves. There's a decision at Easter to live behind the figs um, of Adam or the robes of Jesus. And that's the choice. You can't live behind figs and behind the robes of Jesus at the same time. You can have, you can have, uh, you can have fake or you can have healing, but you can't have both. And Jesus, the one that comes to save our souls, not just to free us from Rome, but to save our souls and to give us sonship, comes to confront those fig leaves, comes to speak to those, those fake things that we're hiding behind, the fake smiles and the fake happiness and the fake religion and the dead religion and so forth, because he doesn't just come to empty the tombs. He has to confront the temple first. He has to confront the old law and the old rules that we, that we live and, and, and tout and hide behind. Number two, if you want to be fixed or new, that he comes to confront the real idol that's in the middle of all of our temples, which is money. Uh, um, uh, uh, my good friend, I, I'm just going to brag on my buddy Matt. Matt is the best barista at City Lights, hands down. If you're a barista at City Lights, you're number two, but you're not number one. I'm just kidding. Uh, Matt does, does, does coffee outside every week. There he is. Um, Matt was here uh, uh, at the 5 a.m. right before Timothy got here. I told him, like, kind of like the, uh, the little Camry that parks next to the, Buga the, Buga the CEO Bugatti, and, uh, and uh, he's ready to get a raise. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I've just been, I've been, I don't know why, but I've just been, it's been sticking out to me. It just made me think of this just, just a moment ago. But, um, I mean, I just think about this equation in, in the American, you know, industrial life that we live and the workaday world that we live in. Like, what would happen if we gave the same fruit and, and effort that we gave to our jobs as we did to the kingdom of heaven? What would happen? What would happen if we did, like, if you do for, for money what you won't do for God, that's prostitution. What would happen? Like, if Jesus turned the tables in a commercialized, consumeristic background, right, that we see church as a place to volunteer, right, and work as a place to work, if we actually worked for the kingdom the way we worked for Michelin, what could we get done? If, if truly the, the tables of our heart were turned over to see ourselves saved, not just comforted. Lastly, what if, um, what if he came and, and he confronted our temples, you know, the, the Caesars of, of our life, like, he's like, you know why? You should just give your taxes to Caesar because the rulership of Caesar is not your problem. The rulership of your life is your problem. And as neglecting and as abusive as the government is for Republicans and Democrats, you're just as abusive and neglective to the people that are under you and your neighbors and your children and so forth. There is no tomb without a temple confrontation, without tearing down the temple. And that's why he says, I'm come to, not to restore the temple, but to tear it down. But I will raise it in three days, is what the promise of Easter really means. <coughs> Let me call, for, uh, call uh, the team forward for worship. And I'm still got to get used to this stage. Hopefully just pray I don't fall off of it right after this. But um, let's just ask for the Holy Spirit to, to work in us. Let's enter, let's open up our gates that he would come in. Let's, um, let's um, lay down our micromanagement and stage management of the Holy Spirit over Easter and just really allow him to do what he wants to do um, in this season of our lives. And so, Father, we just, um, with even the half-hearted praise that we have in our heart, Lord, if, if there's any faith in this room, we just leverage it towards your son, and um, we just agree with that crowd that you are, um, you're the Hosanna from the highest. Lord, we just thank you that um, on the days that we got it and the days that we didn't, um, that you are the pioneer of our salvation, not us. And so, Lord, we just give you permission we just swing wide the gates of our heart, and we just say, Lord, we thank you for saving us in the ways that we're getting it, but also we just thank you that you don't listen to us and that you, um, and we give you permission to interrupt us. And Father, we just thank you for sending a good Savior, sending the one that continues to confront us in the ways that we need to get confronted, um, speaking to us again in the ways we didn't listen the last time, for answering the prayers um, that we didn't mean sometimes and interrupting our lives. We just ask that your kingdom would come and your will be done. I pray for salvations, Lord, in this church and across Greenville. Um, I pray for phony kings to get set aside for true kings. I thank you for the King Jesus to come into our lives, Lord, and interrupt and tear down anything that you want to do that we might have life and life abundant.
And so I just pray that you would occupy this praise, uh, this place with praise this morning and faith. And uh, we, just, we just trust you to come in and, um, and to give us new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship.
thank you that hope is alive today, Lord. That our hope in you is something that goes beyond a moment 2,000 years ago, Lord, but it lasts us for eternity. A hope for our failure, a hope for our fear, a hope for our sin, all of it found in you, Jesus. So we just pray that your spirit would help our faith, Lord, just to, to trust in your promise, the promise of your gospel, the promise of salvation, and that there's nothing we could do because you have done everything for us on our behalf. And so we place our hope in you in the finished work of the cross. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Well, for being here. Thank you all for being here. Um, happy Palm Sunday. Don't forget, we'll see some of you at the sunrise service next week. Bring your own flowers. And we have some donuts out there. Um, if you have a Connect card or a prayer card, Stick it in the box. Have a great week.